Hello and welcome to the CircuitPython community meeting for October 19th, 2020. Uh, we have this meeting every Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern on the Adafruit Discord server, which everyone is welcome to join by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. Uh, that will get you on our Discord server where people chat all week. And then on Mondays, as I said, we have this in the vo this chat in the voice channel. Um, if you'd like to participate, just a reminder that uh, participate by speaking. Uh, be aware that you do need to be in the CircuitPython Nisa's role uh, to get permission to speak into the channel. Uh, we had some spam folks, so we've had to lock it down a bit. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined so far. Um, this meeting, uh, let me run down how it goes. Um, I guess I should say what CircuitPython and Adafruit are first. So CircuitPython is uh, a version of Python designed for inexpensive con computers called microcontrollers. They're all contained in one little chip, and they are very inexpensive to get into uh, to purchase, which is awesome. Um, Adafruit sponsors CircuitPython development, including myself and a, a number of others in this meeting. So please support Adafruit by going to adafruit.com and purchasing uh, whatever CircuitPython hardware or other hardware uh, suits your fancy. Um, this meeting, like I said, normally happens on Mondays, but we do have a calendar uh, that has the exact dates because we do shift for U.S. holidays usually. Um, so just be aware of that as well. And if you're in the CircuitPythonista's role, uh, you're welcome to be in that role even if you don't want to speak during the meeting. Uh, you'll just get pinged by us uh, when we say, here's the latest note stock and here's when the meeting is, that sort of stuff. So uh, just ask us in the text chat and we're, we'd be happy to add you. Um, this meeting is run in five parts. Uh, we start with community news, which is kind of an overview of... Uh, what's been happening related to Python and CircuitPython kind of around the interwebs. After that, we have a section where we go over the kind of statistics of the health of the project. Um, that is like CircuitPython more broadly, but and then also the core, the libraries, and Blinka, which are like the three kind of pillars of the larger CircuitPython effort. Um, after that, we have the first of our two round robin sections. Um, we do these two round robin sections as a way for everyone to get a chance to speak. Um, so if you're in the voice channel and you're just listening in, like uh, some folks have already said, just let us know you're lurking. Uh, in the notes doc, uh, we should have a list of everybody in the in the voice channel plus anybody who left notes, and we'll know whether you're lurking or not. And and so when I go through the round robin, I will start and then go down the list alphabetically from there. Uh, by designating you as lurking early just means that uh, we can roll right from one to another. Uh, the first section is uh, all about hug reports, which is a chance for us to say thank you to folks for the work that they've been doing. Um, so take a couple minutes and, and just point out the people that have been doing really awesome things uh, since you had the chance to say that last time. So that's the first of the round robin sections. The second one is status updates. Uh, status updates is a chance again for each of us to talk a little bit about what we what we've been working on and what we plan on working on in the coming coming week. Uh, the benefit of that is that if somebody's worked on something related to what you're working on, they can give tips or tricks on how to do that. So uh, and it also gives us a broad overview of kind of like what everyone is up to, which is really fun. And uh, there's lots of good things. The last section we have is called In the Weeds, and this is a section where we can basically talk about anything that we're interested in. Um, it's meant to be kind of this catch-all long-form sort of thing at the end uh, if we have things to discuss. Um, this meeting is recorded, I should mention. Um, for those of you who are unaware of that, uh, the meeting is recorded so that it can be posted and people can listen to it later. We really strive to work out in the open, and that's one way that we can do that, is having this public public meeting and making it accessible to folks who are uh, checking it out after the fact. So um, like I said, it happens at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern on Mondays if folks want to join in who have been uh, just listening in since then. And with that, um, I think I got all the housekeeping. Um, so let's go on to the first section, which is community news. 
Uh, I should say the notes doc uh, has been linked in the text channel and it gets uh, linked to from the recordings as well. So if you are listening to this uh, and want to be able to skip around, uh, taking time, I take time codes so that you're able to kind of look through the notes doc and see the things that are interesting and then skip to those parts of the meeting. Um, the meeting does tend to run an hour to an hour and a half long. So uh, sit back and relax. And if you're watching this later, take a look at the notes doc and see what interests you. Okay. So first up in community news is uh, if you're looking for a mini tutorial on getting started with Adafruit streaming data, uh, Foamy Guy, Anik Data, and Kevin, uh, my techno talent, uh, Kevin uh, Thomas, I believe, has put together this really cool uh, tutorial on how to do CircuitPython IoT streaming data. Uh, so check that out. Second up, uh, we mentioned this a bit last week, but uh, it's also we're advertising it again. The Microbit version two has been announced. Um, the Microbit Educational Foundation announced the new Microbit available in November at the same same price point as the original. Um, the latest Microbit will fit right into your existing lessons and materials. Make code and MicroPython code will work in the same way as they do on the original Microbit. More features, including e easy ways to take AI and ML into the classroom, will be released throughout 2021. Um, some new features of the board, a more powerful Nordic NRF52833 processor, a MEMS microphone and speaker, capacitive touch sensor pad, and power-saving mode. Uh, for more details, you can watch the video uh, about the microbit on YouTube, read the announcement, check out the tech specs, and read the Adafruit blog. Next up, uh, hot off the presses from today, uh, the Raspberry Pi Foundation released a uh, Raspberry Pi 4 compute module. Uh, this takes the same chip as the Pi 4 and puts it on a module that can go on other boards. Um, it says, the Raspberry Pi 4 compute module was announced Monday containing the same processor as the Raspberry Pi 4 as various RAM and flash options uh, at purchase, but no onboard expandability. The board breaks from previous modules coming in a new form factor. I.O. signals are brought out on two high-density perpendicular connectors, one for power and low-speed interfaces, and one for high-speed interfaces. Uh, there is also an I.O. carrier board available, which breaks out all the interfaces available, including the P PCIe slot. A CAD for the I.O. board is available in KeyCAD, which is exciting. Um, and a note for myself as well, it, I just looked at the I.O. board and it looks like it breaks out the USB device functionality as well, which is something I'd, I'd love to see for a future CircuitPython thing. Um, and I know that uh, Adafruit has some on order if you, if you want to pick those up from Adafruit. Um, okay, more Adafruit news. Um, Adafruit... 16 is shipping and we do have some slots open so if you want to get in on the halloween edition of adabox that we do every year um it ships uh i think this says ships this month but i think it's actually like within the next few days uh maybe a week or two don't don't quote me on that uh it says there are a few openings for adabox 16 left uh cur curated adafruit products unique collectibles and exclusive discounts all delivered quarterly um Halloween plans have probably changed this year. Halloween is going to happen with an Ada box, learn some new skills, and have something fun. Uh, the, the contents can be used in CircuitPython. Subscribe now or give the Ada box as a gift. Go to adafruit.com slash Ada box, or I guess adabox.com works as well. And Mark points out in the chat that my credit card was charged, so guessing it's real soon now. Jerry says, uh, US, UPS says mine is shipped. So yeah, uh, there are a few more spots, I think. So uh if you order now, I think they're pretty quick with shipping, so you could expect to get it by Halloween still. Uh, but don't wait. Okay, and last up, um, and I forgot to say this. So penultimate thing is why learning Python is perfect for beginners, career changers, and anyone else. Uh, maybe you're looking for a language that's useful and powerful, but still access accessible to new coders. Maybe you've already started coding and you're considering Python, but not sure if it's the right language for you. Whatever your situation or current level of coding knowledge, this post will help you decide if you should learn Python or not. So check out this blog post with his Learn to Code with me. Uh, and thank you, Foamy Guy, for linking it there. Um, and then last up, I should say that these all came from the uh, Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. 
which is publicly drafted every week on the uh, CircuitPython weekly newsletter uh, repo and largely put together by Ann B. So thank you to Ann for doing that. Uh, if you have news stories about CircuitPython, regular Python, MicroPython, uh, we'd love to have them and highlight them in the newsletter. So please reach out to Ann uh, with all your leads on the latest and greatest stories about those things. Um, and uh, you can contact Ann via Twitter at, at Ann Engineer, which is A N N E underscore engineer, or email Ann B at Adafruit.com. All right, let's go to section two. Section two is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. Uh, this is a kind of objective statistics view uh, meant to give uh, some grounding to the things that, and priorities that we want to do. So first up, um, I'll go over some stats overall. So overall, we had 21 pull requests merged from 17 different authors. Uh, some new names on here are TechWolfie, LaubDM, uh, Edrig, Anton2, ETEQ, Cybot101, Senderos, uh, My Techno Talent are all new, I think. Uh, we had 10 reviewers, uh, so thank you to all our reviewers. Just as a reminder, um, as always, reviewing is a great way to help us out. Uh, it tends to be the bottleneck in open source projects. The more reviewers we have, the more authors we can have. So uh, if you want to level up like uh, Gambler has just done, uh, please reach out to us. We'd love to get you reviewing stuff. Um, issues wise, uh, issues are how we track bug reports and feature requests. Uh, so overall, we had 18 closed issues by seven people, eight opened by eight people. So we're net down 10, which is great. And we have the Hacktoberfest label on 26 issues. And uh, with that, let, I will go on to the core. I want to try, I used to do an overall overview, uh, but I think we should actually do that per section. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to try switching it up. Okay. So for the core, uh, we had five pull requests merged from seven different authors. So thank you to all those authors and one reviewer. So thank you, Jeff, for reviewing, uh, pull request wise. We had 16 open pull requests where the, we have two that are older than a hundred days. So we should take a look at those. Um, and then a number that are, uh, aging a bit. So, uh, let's try to take a closer look at all of the pull requests. Um, looks like we've got the latest ones. The, the newest one is two days old, so we should take a look at the all of those ones that are between like 10 days and 80 days old. So um, if you have a pull request that's outstanding, uh, please make sure that it's clear uh, what you're waiting for or what the plan is going forwards. Issues-wise, we had uh, one closed issue by one person and zero open by zero people. Um, so we're net down one, uh, which is good. We have a uh, Hacktoberfest label on 18 issues, and we have a total of 321, 24 open issues. Uh, this issue count is uh, kind of ever-growing. We, we were a little bit behind on the rate that we're increasing, uh, but what we do do is we triage the issues by assigning a milestone, and the milestones that we're focusing on right now are 6.0.0, which is the... the uh, our goal for the next stable release. And it has zero open issues, which is really good. And then we have a total of 18 issues related to 6.x stuff, which is like the stuff we're gonna do soon, but not immediately. And uh, three support issues and then 288 long-term issues. Those are the ones that are like, yeah, they're kind of an issue and we wanna do them eventually, but we have no plan. Um, we have zero issues not assigned a milestone, which means we're up to date on triage, which is great. And uh, overall, uh, for the core, we are uh, just released the release candidate zero. So please test that and let us know if you find anything that you think should kind of invalidate the stability and cause us to do another release candidate. So please uh, take RC0 and put it on all your projects and let us know if any of them don't work. Um, so that we can fix those bugs before we, we get the wider audience of uh, the stable folks, the people that just install the stable stuff. Um, so that's where we are on the core. Uh, let's kick it over to Katni for the libraries. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. So this is 
uh, information about all of the CircuitPython libraries. So everything that is Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore library name. We have 13 pull requests merged by nine authors, including uh, four of the new names, um, Tech Wolfie, LaufDM, Cybot101, and My Techno Talent, and nine reviewers, including uh, Gambler21, who is our new reviewer. So thank you very much to everyone who has continued to review, and thank you very much to Mark for joining us. Um, of those 13, one was 157 days old, which is excellent, it means we're slowly going through um, older PRs, uh, and most of them were less than a week old. We have uh, 29 open pull requests uh, at the moment. Um, some of them are very much aging, but uh, still being worked on, um, including uh, making sure that they're actually getting updated with all of the latest uh, changes to the libraries that we've had over the past however long. Um, so we're, we're keeping up with it. Um, there's at least one that the person is working very slowly on it, and we have continued to work with them. Uh, we had 14 issues closed by seven people and seven opened by seven people, so we're net down to 208 open issues. We have eight good first issues, which means we have eight Hacktoberfest labeled issues. If you're interested in all of this uh, and perhaps interested in contributing to the CircuitPython project, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all the open PRs, all of the open issues and um, some library infrastructure issues. Uh, the issue page uh, for open issues can be searched by label, which means if you are looking for a good first issue, maybe that's your level, um, then you can search for good first issue. If you're looking for something more complicated, you could search for bug or enhancement. Um, and we have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. And uh, we are always available to answer questions. Um, and as Jeff points out, if you are participating in Hacktoberfest and you want one of your library pull requests to be considered, you need to let us know. Um, we did not opt in all of the libraries. So what has to happen is we actually have to add a label to your pull request for it to be validated. We're happy to do that, but we need you to let us know. Um, so feel free to check out circuitpython.org slash contributing, give it a search. Um, see if there's anything that is up your alley, see if you have any of the hardware for that sort of thing, and uh, let us know if you have any questions. Uh, we had no new libraries in the last seven days. Uh, we do have a list of updated libraries available in the notes. Overall, um, we are continuing to see a lot of contributions, uh, both internally and externally, which is great. Um, we had uh, at least one new library recently that was written by a community member, so that was uh, amazing to see. Um, and libraries are a great way to get started. Uh, if you Obviously, if you're going to hack on the core, um, chances are you need to know C. Um, so if you're looking to do some Python hacking, uh, the libraries are a great place to get started. So check that out. That's where we're at. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. Next up, we have a Blinka update from Melissa. Uh, hello. So this week we had three pull requests merged by two authors and two reviewers. There are currently three open pull requests, and there were three closed issues by one person and one open by one person. Uh, there are zero issues assigned the Hacktoberfest label at the moment, and we have 26 open issues. There are, have been 1,975 PyPI downloads in the last week, and we currently are supporting 52 boards. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, do you have any overview stuff? How would you summarize oh. where Blinka's going right now? Ah, uh, yeah, I could summarize it. Uh, right now, Blinka is the... the um, the new compute module four came out so we want to add that when it comes out to it mm. and we were just trying to add boards as they come in uh over the last week we've pretty much just been uh doing any kind of fixes such as the uh adafruit pure io module uh now supports python 3.9 Oh, nice. And uh, so the requirement update in Blinka has been updated to use the latest version of that. Awesome. Well, keep up the good work. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks. All right. Next up, we have Hug Reports. 
Hug Reports is a chance for us to say thank you to folks for the work that they've been doing. Um, it's a great way to both reinforce what we value as a community and simply just say thank you to the folks for doing awesome work. Um, this is done as a round robin, so I will start and then go through the the note list, which also mirrors the f folks in the voice channel. Uh, if you are in the voice channel and just listening in, uh, please just say that you're lurking. Or uh, if you have notes that you'd like me to read off, drop those in the notes doc, and I'm happy to read those off as well. Um, I think that's it. So I will start and take a time code, and then we'll go through the list. Okay. First up, I want to say thank you to Akbar from Logger Data for uh, discussing on hardware testing. This is something that I've played around with and Summersoft has played around with, but the idea that like we actually test code on CircuitPython boards as we commit things and stuff um, is really interesting. Logger Data is a, a, a pretty new startup that is trying to provide that as a service to folks. And so I, I chatted with Akbar about uh, doing that, uh, using CircuitPython as a test case for their systems. So I think, I think he was pretty on board, so we'll see where that goes. But uh, either way, thanks to Akbar for taking uh, time out of their day to chat with me. Um, thank you to Ask Patrick W for working to fix uh, CircuitPython for Python 3.9. I saw that go by. Uh, thank you to Noe and Pedro for the promo, Im promo image for the deep dives that I've been doing. I don't think I mentioned this last week, but it's a it's a great picture. It's super helpful. So thanks to them for putting that together. Um, thank you to Internal Dev at Adafruit for uh, changing the homepage. Uh, they've made a few tweaks. There's a live button at the top of the homepage now for Adafruit.com, um, which I think is the reason I peaked at 85 concurrent YouTube viewers last week, which is very exciting. For those of you who don't know, I stream on uh, the Adaf Adafruit channels at 2 p.m. on Fridays, um, so check that out. And uh, there's also a an easier find uh, to find link about new stuff on Adafruit.com as well. So if you want to just see what the new products are, check that out. Um, hug report to Unexpected Maker for digging into the UF2 bootloader, and uh, thank you to Jerry N for jumping on RC0 and testing it uh, on all the different projects that Jerry has. So uh, thank you to all those folks, and let's keep moving through the list as I circle around and it looks like uh, next up is Dan okay uh, thank you Scott for uh, doing the RC.0 release and uh, I had been supposed to I was supposed to take over a lot of release duties but then I had my bike accident and so thank you for stepping in and going back and doing the release stuff thanks very much mm -hmm. Um, and then also you fixed uh, some sleep issues for RC.0, I think. And thanks for fixing that. That was a, a last remaining thing, which seemed pretty important. And thanks to Warrior of Wire, who has um, is very interested in getting async await working in CircuitPython and has cleaned up some remaining semantic issues in the implementation. So we now have a really clean base to work from. And Warrior of Wire has a, li a sample library called TaskO which you might look at and use as a model or as an experiment for doing some async stuff. I'm looking forward to that. I don't have time right now, but I'm really looking forward to that. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Next up, we have notes from David G. David says, uh, hug report to Dan H. and Jerry N. for helping me testing uh, HCI BLEIO on the Pi portal. And a hug report to Tan Newt for the live streaming that get more and more structured with a checklist and notes with time codes. Uh, yeah, you're welcome, David. And next up, we have DH Meter. Hi, uh, I just want to say thank you for this uh, resource. I'm, I have been uh, working with uh, CircuitPython for the last few months, and uh, it's been been very nice to be able to just talk, uh, ask questions and participate and I guess I was invited today to this meeting I hadn't really thought about it but I, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here so anyways thanks awesome welcome DH meter uh, next up we have notes from Du Wester so Du Wester says hug reports Adafruit for keeping up with everything through 2020 so far and getting what looks to be one heck of an Ada box out and next up is Foamy Guy. All 
right, sorry about that. Let me get back to the notes here. Okay, sorry. Uh, this week, a uh, hug report for uh, Scott and Jeff and Dave Putz and MD Roberts. And uh, I probably am missing a few others. I know there's a bunch of people involved in fixing a weird time uh, slash sleeping clock issue on the STM devices. Um, so anybody involved in fixing and testing that out, I uh, really appreciate that. A uh, hug for Paint Your Dragon uh, for all their work on the M4Eyes project. I got my device out, uh, as you'll see, kind of in my status update. I played with that a fair bit over the weekend. And, uh, you know, being able to dig through some of that older code in the M4Eyes project and also in um, the Arcada library. Uh, that was super helpful to be able to look through that stuff. Uh, to you, Scott, uh, and a group hug as well to everybody else, uh, you know, for the 6.0 RC0 release. Um, nice to see that come along for sure. And then uh, last one for uh, Kevin Thomas for putting together that uh, very nice Pi Portal live data fetching uh, example that's linked uh, up in the community news. That's all I got for this week. Awesome. Thank you, Filmy Guy. All right. Next up, we have notes from Folknology, who says, a hug report to Dan H., Dashipu, and Jeff E. for helping me understand my unusual circuit Python spy issues and suggesting ways forward. Uh, next up, we have... Uh, Hope and Wayne and Jay Guitar are lurking, so we'll go to Jeff. Well, Scott, first I wanted to thank you for uh, keeping track of everything that needed to go in the 600 release candidate. I think that took a big chunk of your time and attention, particularly on Friday. And yeah, just thanks for staying on top of that. And thanks to GitHub's uh, C. Walther again for working on this uh, supervisor allocator and sticking with it. We did, I think, finally merge that PR. So um, I have some things that I want to build on top of that soon. And I'm excited about that. And then thank you to Nick Kamaris. He's published a couple of YouTube videos about CircuitPython. And it's always great to see more content coming up around this community that we have. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Next up is Jerry. Hello. Uh, so just a. Thank, thank you and congratulations to everybody on the release of 6.0 release candidate zero. And um, and uh, thanks to an uh, unexpected maker for making the Feather S2 boards. Oh, I missed the S there. Um, <laughs> they're, uh, got some in there, lots of fun to play with. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry. The cat likes them too. <laughs> cat approved. All right. Jay Marcelino is next. Hi, everyone. I'm new here. Um, just been lurking. Uh, just want to thank thank you, everyone, for the 6 release. It's looking amazing with more low-power stuff, which I love. Uh, looking forward to work with that. And I really liked the video last time about Sleep.io, and not just Sleep.io, but a lot more from Scott. So thank you for that. Awesome. Thank you and welcome. Thanks for joining again. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Katni. Hello. So I want to thank Carter for all the amazing forum support. Every so often I get emails um, through our internal support um, email thread, and it's something I need to fix, but uh, I would have missed it if uh, Carter wasn't keeping track of the forums. So that's always excellent, and I never mind helping out there. Um, a hug report to John Park for keeping me entertained. Um, I want to thank Bruce for all the amazing graphics. Bruce is our internal graphics guy. Um, everything he does is amazing. So it's always great whenever we need um, anything done up for graphics wise. Bruce has always got it and it's always done quickly and it's always excellent. Um, I want to thank everyone in the Circuit Python channel and Discord for continuing to welcome new folks. Um, this meeting is a testament to that. We have a ton of new folks here, um, a lot of whom I, I didn't scroll back over the last four days, but I did scroll back over the last few hours um, earlier this morning, and it was just excellent to see new folks being welcomed in and joining and feeling comfortable and uh, feeling good about things. So that was great. And a group hug to the entire community for continuing to be an amazing, supportive, positive place. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. And you're, you, the community is that way because of you. So thank you. Um, okay, next up is Kmatch98. Okay, thanks. Uh, I got one hug report for Foamy Guy. Thank you for your multitasking learn guide, and you snuck in a clever way of using Python dictionaries. I learned something else there too. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Kmatch. Okay, next up is Maker Melissa. 
I just wanted to give a hug report to Katni for covering the Blinken notes last week and a group hug to everyone. Thanks, Melissa. All right, next up we have notes from Mark, a.k.a. Gambler, uh, who says, uh, hug report to Katni for setting me up as a reviewer. A hug report to Dan and Tanut for helping me through my first two PR questions. And last but not least, we have notes from Stargirl, who wasn't able to make the meeting. She says, hug report, a hug to all that worked on the UF2 SAMD X1 bootloader. It saved me so much time and energy. And with that, that's hug reports. Thank you all for joining, especially the new folks. Happy to have some new folks in here. Uh, next up, we have a another round robin, which is status updates. Uh, like last time, we'll go through the list and skip over the folks who are lurking or read the notes off for the folks that left notes. Um, this time, we're talking just briefly about what you've been working on and what you plan on coming uh, plan on working on in the coming week. It's really good just to have an idea of what everyone's doing, uh, what they're interested in, and also give tips if. Uh, you've done something related and may have a, a place for people to start. And with that, I will start off myself. I think I remembered something else to add to it later. So uh, last week I fixed 6.0 issues and did the RC0 release. Uh, this week I'm continuing my deep sleep API work. And I also wanted to add that uh, if issues come up with re release candidate zero, I will... Uh, take a look at those and kind of figure out whether they're blocking or fix fix them or uh, what have you. Um, if we find issues that we think we, like are make it unstable, what I'll do is I'll plan on doing another release candidate this week. Um, if we find no issues that we think are blocking, uh, I think my plan will be that like we give it a week and if we don't find anything, we'll just mark it as stable. So if we don't find anything this week, I'll check in with everyone in this meeting next week and say, is everybody okay making it 6.0 stable? And then we'll say yes or no and uh, go from there. So that's kind of my plan on how we're going to get from uh, 6.0 to, uh, to RC0 to 6.0. And Jeff asks, uh, what's the plan for branching? Uh, my plan is to basically I'll branch off RC zero when I need to make it RC one. Um, so yeah, I, I plan on doing it from RC zero and then, uh, unrelated to circuit Python, but important nonetheless, uh, I filled out my ballot yesterday and I'm going to drop it off today. I live in Washington. We have all mail in voting and everybody got theirs. And, uh, so we can fill them out and drop them off. Um, so I will be doing that later today as well. Okay, let's circle around and go to Dan. Oh, okay. So um, one thing I did, I had implemented um, HCI-based BLEIO. That's uh, BLEIO that works with things like uh, Bluetooth dongles and also works with um, uh, the ESP32 uh version of BLE or Bluetooth in general. So originally I had just put it on the Metro M4 airlift board because that has uh, the ESP32 on the board, but it actually could work with any board that could use a, an ESP32 breakout, which is basically everything except M0, except SAMD21 M0s. So I, I added that, uh, compiled that into all the firmware. It's pretty chunky. It's like 25 kilobytes and it's gonna get larger as we add some more features to it, but right now it fits, so that's good. Um, and thanks also, I forgot that uh, David Cloud and um, Jerry tested it. And also, um, I'm, there's a Blinka library called Blinka BLEIO, uh, which is, was sort of working, now it works much better with Mac OS uh, because I fixed some bugs and because we I brought it up to date to support Bleak 0.8.0 bleak is an underlying python library that supports ble on um, multiple platforms um, it's done by henrik blind and uh, it's kind of a moving target right now so uh, we have to keep up to date with its api um, one thing i noticed when i was testing this is that if you control c a script that uses um, ble on windows or linux then 
uh, it doesn't reset anything, and the the underlying software still thinks that the device is connected, and various bad things happen. So I have to add some code to the library to um, clean up on Control C. And I'm working on a guide with examples to show how to use this library on host computers, how to install it and how to use it. Uh, and there'll be some sort of straightforward things like using a pulse oximeter. And there will also be things like using the Adafruit service um, library or the Adafruit service UF2s that we have running on our various Bluefruit ports. OK, that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. OK, next up we have DH meter. Hi. Um, so I, I, I guess I've, I've been for the past few months working on a product prototype um, and chose to, to use uh, CircuitPython because of a small team of folk who primarily uh, sort of data analysis people who are familiar with Python. And uh, so just trying to do things that everyone can understand and look at the details. Um, so no, no embedded experience on the team other than myself. So mm -hmm. uh, in, in this context, we're essentially trying to get the data um, that we're pulling off of a you know, sensor connected to uh, uh, the ADS-115 Adafruit board. And we're just put, you know, move that up to the cloud where we have our, our data analysis pipeline. And, um, and so to that end, I'm basically moving data that's captured on the device to um, ultimately, I guess, an iPhone application or even everyone's familiar with uh, Pythonista, but it's a, it's a application on iPhone that allows you to write Python scripts, uh, exposes some of the underlying uh, libraries on the iPhone and, uh, for instance, Bluetooth. So I, I use the, essentially the Bluetooth transport there to move the data then from the phone and then from the phone to the cloud. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyways, so it's like we have that stood up and working. I'm, you know, I'm not. It's, it's very uh, basic and a bit chunky, but it uh, it works, and it's. I think that, uh, I'm just overall very interested in this uh, uh, acceleration of of uh, access of the bridge between hardware and uh, the data mm -hmm. analysis pipeline. You know, the machine learning is an incredible incredibly powerful tool and we've been using it to great effect um, so it's uh, it's very exciting um, so anyways I I'm ha I there's a bunch of stuff I'm doing I, I got feedback uh, that it might be interesting to the community I'm happy to talk about it in other contexts um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know and I, I, I certainly if there's if there's some way I can transform what I'm doing you know, to something useful for others that that sounds interesting too I, not so clear exactly how to do that so okay yeah well it looks like you have an in the weeds topic which means that you and i can chat about it a lot okay. <laughs> I, I have lots of ideas around this okay great uh so we'll okay. we'll hit that a little bit later unless you unless you can't stay the whole time then we can rearrange things no 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 i, I have questions that i put in that topic and and i i'm also just who, who's talking right now just so i know who to call it uh t-a-n-n-e-w-t Scott. Oh, great! Awesome. Nice to meet you. Does it, is it not showing? It is showing. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm I'm looking at the document. I'm oh yeah, bit, no problem. I'm a bit of a, a neophyte to these tools. So apologies. You'll get better. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll come to every meeting and you'll just you'll become a whiz at it. Awesome. Well, welcome. And uh, yeah, we'll talk in a bit. Uh, okay. Next up, uh, it's actually a bit out of order, but we have. Uh, Notes from David Glaub, so I'll read those off. Um, so David says, uh, testing Neo Trellis on the Cutie Pie Express, uh, got the runtime error max maximum recursion depth exceeded issue uh, with a link to the discussion on Discord. Um, trying to help Osa Maria, I think is how you say it, uh, from Sweden that contacted me on Twitter for an IoT and wearable with a link to the Twitter thing there as well. Um, which I'd like to check out. Um, thank you for helping them, David. Uh, testing HCI BLEA on Pi Portal. No support for scan yet. Uh, did a Corona app detector, uh, which is github.com slash dcloud slash circuitpython underscore contact scanner. Uh, clue with the NeoPixel output and clue with the NeoTrellis output. Uh, this is a BLE scanner that 
uh, listens for the Apple Google protocol uh, contact tracing advertisements, uh, which is, I think is really interesting. Uh, next week, uh, the Corona app with output on the built-in screen and uh, trying to fix my matrix portal soldering for the 64 by 64. And with that, we have Foamy Guy next. All right. Uh, so last week, uh, over this past weekend, I was playing around with the Monster Mask quite a bit, and I ended up putting together a library for that that you can import and then uh, make a constructor call, and it will set up all of the built-in hardware for you. So you can use the second screen, or both screens, I should say, and then you can use light sensor you can use the the touch pin on the nose you can use the three buttons and then also there's an accelerometer you can get data from that as well all uh, nice and easy from the library there um other couple things i worked on last week uh was helped out kevin a little bit on the pi portal uh, live data example gave him uh, some ideas on uh, breaking up the text and getting that put onto the screen and then uh tested a few other small prs i know the bm E or maybe it's BMP 680. I always get those two uh, mixed up. I don't know which one it is, but <laughs> tested out a PR there and a couple other smaller ones uh, that I'm sure I'm forgetting. And then for next week, uh, the thing, the main thing I want to try to do project wise is design and print some kind of little stake or something that's going to stick into the front of a pumpkin and try to hold the monster mask on the front so it can have uh, eyes on the front of the pumpkin there. Uh, and that's what I got for this week. Awesome. Thank you, Foamy Guy. Now I understand why you're doing Monster Mask stuff. All right, next up, we have notes from Folknology, who says, uh, testing a Reve of the alloy feather and CAD changes for Red B. Uh, working on internal ESP32 S2 slash FPGA spy bus. See in the weeds notes later. Interesting. What FPGA is it? I might I might be interested in this stuff. <laughs> Ice 40, nice. Okay, uh, next up we have Jeff. Hello again. So the bulk of my time last week was spent working on Arduino. Um, since I did the can on the SAM E51 for CircuitPython, Lamore said, why don't you do it for Arduino? Um, that is something that I will be wrapping up soon, but unfortunately on Thursday, I fried the prototype board that I was working on and uh, I need fresh hardware before I can wrap that up. So I shifted to finishing up a guide for an RPN calculator that I had created using CircuitPython and the sharp memory display. And that hopefully would come out later this week. We'll have to see how that fares in the um, uh, proofreading and final approval process. So uh, this week, I am going to do a check of accumulated guide feedback for my guides on the Adafruit Learn system. I will start up working on CAN support for the ESP32-S2 in CircuitPython. And if I get that far, uh, the next up is more ESP32-S2 stuff, probably adding audio out so that we can play WAV files. And yeah, that'll definitely cover me for a whole week right there. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Next up is Jerry. Next up is Jerry. Hello. Uh, yes, I spent a bunch of time updating a bunch of different boards to 6.0 RC0 and haven't run into any, any issues related to the newest release yet. Uh, keep keep working through them, trying different things. Um, and I received a, a couple of unexpected Maker F Feather S2 boards, so I've been playing with those and uh, and exploring their, their capabilities. And um, they're nice because it, it, there's certainly a much much easier form factor to work with than the than the Saula. Mm -hmm. <laughs> up a lot less space. And um, then I, I one of the board, boards I've been playing with on there was this the new uh, BNO08X breakout. I ran into a funny little problem that I, I put it so if I run it on a Grand Central M4, it works as as advertised. Um, if I run it on the ESP32 S2, either on the Seller Rover or on the Unexpected Maker board, um, one of the um, demos crashes uh, pretty badly. Um, crashes CircuitPython crashes or, or, raises or raises an exception? Well, no, it doesn't. It just hangs. And okay. if I, when I try and unhang it, sometimes it, it causes me to lose contact with the REPL, and then eventually my computer reboots. <laughs> my, 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 so something's 
definitely not happy with it. Mm -hmm. But that's not very reproducible. The 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 the, crack, the um, reboot part of that thing isn't very reproducible, but the hang is. So I put an issue in. I put the issue against Circuit Python since it works on the on the M4. Uh, I assume it's probably more related to the ESP32 I2C than it is to the library, but that's not really determined yet. Mm -hmm. So let me know if, if anyone looks at it. First of all, if somebody could reproduce it, that'd be great to know. If, if it, you know, um, so take a look at the issue. And um, there also were some other issues that I came across in that to do with the Raspberry Pi, but they, they seem to be being worked on. One is One of the examples doesn't work well, um, Lady Ada suggested it might be a clock stretching issue, so that's a, a different problem. Mm -hmm. But um, and maybe I don't know if it, if clock stretching if, if clock stretching is needed. I don't know how the S two handles that if it does. So it may be it may be something related there. It's the same the same um, example that fails on the Raspberry Pi also fails on the uh, is the one that crashes the uh, S two. Mm -hmm. So um, I, a lot more to do with it, but it's, it's been a little tricky to troubleshoot because it keeps really, it gets nasty when I try and <laughs> right. try and test it, but uh, I'll keep, I'll keep playing with it. See if I can narrow down the problem. Uh, I'll try to take a look this week at, at it as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Again, mostly if anyone who's got the hardware, if they can, some, it'd be nice to someone else can just, just try and run it. It's just, it's the stock examples in the, uh, in the library, it's the one called More Reports. Um, it just it really it really loads up the the uh, device, putting out tens of information. Hmm. And um, if you run it, it just dies. Hmm. Um, and that's it. Awesome. That's enough fun. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry. Sure. Okay. Next up is Jay Marcelino. Again, um, so I, I didn't mention, but I, I work for a company called Rack Wireless. Uh, we do a lot of LoRa boards and gateways. Uh, we have a new product called the Wiz Block. This is a modular uh, kind of building block style uh, device. So where you can uh, use a, a core with an NRF 52840 plus uh, the latest LoRa chip, the SX1262. I uh, made the initial circuit Python for it. It's working well. I'm going to submit uh, that uh, maybe tomorrow. And then I'll start working on porting the tiny LoRa library to the newest chip because the tiny LoRa library is made for the, the older Semtec chip for LoRa. So hopefully I'll get that working soon as well. And that's all for me. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is Katni. Hello. So last week, published a Cutie Pie and LEDs guide for the Cutie Pie and Cutie Pie Hack Express, which uh, led to something that needed to be done, which is adding a frequently asked questions page to the LED animation guide with two questions regarding the SAMD21M0 non-express boards and the SAMD21M0 express boards uh, in terms of using the library with those boards. Spoiler, there's limitations. Um, there's two animations that won't run. The library itself doesn't run on the non-express boards at all. And um, there's a time.monotonic um, issue where it's used for timing the animations. And so if you leave the animations running for over something like 1.165 hours to be exact, um, they slow down. Uh, so the, the timing ends up off, basically. Um, so I included an example that resets the board every time uh, time.monotonic exceeds um, 3,600 seconds, which is an hour, um, to avoid the loss of precision. Um, if you're just running the animations, it's pretty much seamless. You, you really won't notice. Um, it may not work for your project. It may work. You may want to tweak when you want the board to reset. Um, obviously, you can do whatever you want with it, but the, um, the example's there. And there's a very simple explanation of what is happening with this in the frequently asked questions. Uh, if you want a very complicated and thorough explanation of what's happening, check the CircuitPython issues list. Uh, Dan did a um, deep dive into that in one of the issues uh, that explains exactly why um, why this happens. So um, the Cutie Pie and LEDs guide has a basic example to use with the base Cutie Pie because it doesn't work with the LED animations guide. 
So there's an example that has three animations. Um, it's a little bit gnarly for a beginner example, um, but that's because there's functions in it to do animations because there's no library that works. So um, basically I put, I made, uh, there's a ton of comments in it and it made it um, pretty clear in the guide how to customize each one. So if you're just trying to do some basic animations with your cutie pie, you can check that out. If you want to use the um, LED animations library, you're going to have to solder a spy flash chip to the back of your cutie pie. Um, and there's a page that covers that as well. Uh, not the soldering part, <laughs> using the LED animations library with it once you've soldered it. Um, I created two fritzing objects and brainstormed a bunch of cutie pie project ideas uh, this week. Project one, um, bringing that to life, it's a sequential activity timer, which is basically the, so Pomodoro timers is like a whole thing, I which I actually learned today. Um, there's a whole, like concept and technique that goes with it and it doesn't work for everybody um this is more meant for people who forget to take breaks or forget to eat lunch uh so you would say you know i want to work for two hours and then i want to take a 15 minute break and and you set it down on your desk and it's sort of uh, gradient fades through different colors until it reaches red and then if you don't flip it to take a break, um, it starts flashing at you to remind you to take your break. You flip it over, say you want a 15 minute break, you set the other side to 15 minutes and then it flashes at you when 15 minutes is up. It also would work equally well as a hydration reminder where you just set it to gradient down and flash at you every hour to remind you to drink water. So there's gonna be two pages in that guide, um, one with each of those uh, examples. Um, so I'm gonna be starting the guide for that. There's uh, two, four, it turns out, I. Uh, got clarification um four more fritzing objects and then um as well there were two guides that there was feedback on about some issues with uh new product revisions not being in the guide um so i'm going to be updating a couple guides with new product revisions uh to get those all set to go um and that's what i'm up to this week awesome thank you katney all right next up we have kmatch 98 Hey, thanks. Yep, uh, been out for a couple of weeks, so no, no real progress to uh, update right now. But uh, I did get some new, new uh, hardware last week, and hope to get Circuit Python running on a Sala ESP32 S2, uh, with the hope of running a touch screen uh, via parallel. I've heard rumor it may or may not work, but I'm um, gonna try it out, see how it will compare with a Pi Portal, uh, particularly trying to get some smooth scrolling if we can. Hmm. Um, and the reason I've been out is I've been uh, working on refurbishing our washroom, which was time critical as we were running out of laundry. So I had to get that wrapped up and added some more storage in the process. That, that's it. Awesome. Thanks, Kmatch. All right. Next up, we have maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, so last week, I finished writing a BrainCraft Google Assistant guide. So hopefully that'll be out soon. I fixed an issue with the SSD 1351 on the ESP32 in Arduino. I uh, updated some new boards on circuitpython.org. They were added with the latest release candidate um, of CircuitPython. And I fixed a wiring diagram for the SSD 1331 in a guide and updated Adafruit Pure IO library to work on Python 3.9. Uh, this week, I am going to work on writing a guide on creating projects using the Matrix Portal library. I'm going to go through any guide comments and make any necessary changes to any guides I've done. Uh, I'll update some remaining PyTFT guides with the latest instructions, and I'll likely write uh, a product guide later this week. Um, not sure which one specifically yet, though. And other stuff uh, as I worked more on my MIDI keyboard and decided to use logic level shifters so I could use more boards. Uh, though the logic level shifters I used are having some propagation delay issues. Hmm. Uh, it's likely I'm going to be moving to CircuitPython and running the MIDI keyboard. Um, and other stuff is I'm planning on traveling back home uh, this coming weekend. Safe travels. Thanks. And that's it. Thanks, Melissa. Okay, we have notes from Microdev. 
who says, last week I implemented a method to set the custom host name of the Wi-Fi interface on the ESP32S2. Uh, this week I plan to collaborate with Tanut on the Deep Sleep API, which is exciting. Uh, Mr. Certainly is lurking, so it looks like we're done, actually. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for those status updates. Happy to hear what everybody's working on. Uh, next up, we have In the Weeds. Uh, in the Weeds is a section for us to just talk about whatever uh, topics are interesting and potentially longer form. Um, so what the way that you get a topic in, in the weeds, and some folks have already done this, which is awesome, um, is you put your nickname from Discord on there and then a brief blurb about the topic. And uh, what will happen is that I will just go through the list of folks here and kick it over to those folks to introduce their topics. So uh, first up, we have topics from DH Meter. Sorry. I... Um, no worries. I guess, uh, you know, carrying on from my prior uh, description of what I'm up to, um, there are essentially two topics. One is the, you know, how to best uh, implement the, the Bluetooth application that mm -hmm. uh, described. And then I, there's sort of a sub case, which I, I have brought up before on, on the forum, but it's, it's really uh, about synchronous capture of data at a fairly high data rate to disk as a way of storing the massive quantities of data that are being thrown off um, and managing to do that without, uh, I mean, regularly without interruption. Um, and, you know, I'm, I may not be turning off the interrupts correctly, but I end up with these giant, like 23 millisecond, you know, I imagine the system's going off to deal with file, file writing or something like that. And mm -hmm. it, would, it would be nice if I could have a higher priority process that effectively is writing to a buffer and, you know, and, and, and have the, you know, the, the disk stuff be able to happen at a lower priority. Um, and I think where we got to is I sort of faced with a learning how to write a <laughs> an interrupt service routine in the context of uh, the whole uh, circuit Python development, which I can probably do, but I just have been postponing it because I've got so many other things to do. So, uh, but I'm just curious about that as a, uh, as a topic, whether there are any suggestions mm -hmm. about that. I think that this regular, regular uh, data capture is a, a very important use case. There's really kinds of things that, that we're looking at, which is, you know, getting good data for data processing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are the two topics. I'm okay. Not sure, I'm not sure how deep or how... Uh... <laughs> well, we can, we can go as deep as we want. Um, if you're able to turn your mic up, that would be good. I'm, I can hear you cause I have headphones on, but it is a bit quiet. Okay. Can I, maybe that's in the preferences here. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. And actually for those listening, I think if you right click, you can also just turn it up on the discord side oh. as well. So I, is this better? I just increased the volume. I don't know if there suddenly might be feedback, but, um, did that help? Yeah. Better. Yeah. Okay, great. Cool. Okay, so let's take this one at a time. I think let's start with the BLE stuff. Okay. Um, so it's there's a, there's a question I have as to whether um, you want to like update code.py over BLE. Um, um, I that's less important, right? I mean, I, okay. I I mean it might be nice to be able to do that, but I mean obviously you know code update in a way it's you know it's probably safest to just do it. The, the standard way that you know or the the mm -hmm. fu right i i i think we can handle that case we we can handle that case and i think it's i mean i, I don't know again it's be sort of nice to have or something but i'm right not yeah i mean this is something i would love to add but i don't think you actually need it for what you're trying to do yeah uh, because from circuit python you can just construct your service that you're providing and do like all the BLE things that I think you need just from Python. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the thing is that I, I sort of find myself, you know, writing command parsers and then mm -hmm. I, I think there's this whole, you know, state machinery around BLE, which on the, on the iPhone ends up being, you know, an async thing. And on the, on the device, it's more hard coded, and then if you want to have other things going on, you kind of have to work through. It's it's all I sort of wrapped up in this sync async 
discussion, I think that that's been going on that I've been seeing. So I, I'm, I, and again, I'm, I just, I think what it is, I'm not sure I have the right patterns that I'm trying mm -hmm. to, it's like the first time I'm doing a Bluetooth implementation. So I'm kind of learning everything at the same time. And right. just what I ended up with, I'm not that happy with. And I was thinking maybe, maybe you would have some ideas about how it could go, direction it could go, maybe, you know, join forces. I don't, I have no idea. I just, um, you know, sort of doing a, doing a uh, postmortem on what I had just finished. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think sharing what you have so far is the place to start. Okay. Um, I think in terms of like async, like we generally have like native, we either have, uh, what is it? Character buffer or packet buffer that will like basically buffer output stuff for you. Um, yeah, I definitely, I, end, I, you know, I, I tried doing it myself, you know, breaking it at, at the byte level in Python and I definitely knit got a much better performance, obvi I mean, for obvious reasons, probably, but got a, a performance increase by, by just using the line command, right? It, it, it worked quite well. Uh, one thing I wasn't clear about was the timeouts. I, I didn't look like it. there was a, you know, I, and I didn't go really explore it because it just worked, but I, I was thinking that that might be, there might be an opportunity for improvement in speed or something related to a timeout that I may or may not be hitting, and I can't quite mm -hmm. tell. So, but that, I don't know if that's helpful, but that. It's, yeah, I think I'd have to see how you're doing it. But... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dan, did you have thoughts? So I, not specifically about this, about the synchronous, about the one millisecond, or the twenty-three millisecond thing. So. If you, um... Oh, so the, the I think we're we're talking about Bluetooth right now, right? I think that's yeah. uh, right, so right, right, right. I turned other, off my was related to that. Uh, right. I I mean I think. You're using Bluetooth to deliver data to the host to post to the cloud, right? Yeah, That's I mean, the... yeah, effectively the sequence, I mean, I capture data and I don't try to do anything with Bluetooth while I'm capturing data. Um, and then once I have files on the disk later, I upload them. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm doing that with over Bluetooth. Um, in some sense, you know, we need to have a, we need to deploy this out into the field and have people who are non-technical use it. And so I'm sort of trying to create a, basically a Bluetooth uploader mm -hmm. that can run uh, as an app on the phone easily. And that, that's, that's the general problem I'm solving. And I guess in particular, in this case, I'm, you know, turning on a service that's looking for advertising and there's all this stuff that you have to go through. I mean, it's right. not, I suppose, not even that interesting to discuss in detail, but I, I look at it as a kind of, very common thing that probably needs to happen if you're uploading stuff. And I was thinking, well, I probably don't really know what I'm doing. I'm just <laughs> doing the best I can with a kind of a quick prototype. Um, and I was thinking that that, since that probably is common, many people wanting to do the same thing, maybe there's some more robust version that can be built eventually right. that would be, be better, you know? So I, I do want to do a file service and I have the roots of it in CircuitPython, which you may have found, but, uh, it's it needs some more work before it's yeah i, I did not further. Uh, so I'll, I'll go look for it sorry I, I hadn't seen that but it was you know it was geared towards being like in the core so that you could do like code.py back and forth mm -hmm. uh, but there's no reason that you couldn't load other files off the file system that way um it just doesn't it, it, it wasn't we had it on for a lot of development and then we turned it off because it wasn't like secure at all like we ha we didn't have yeah. it behind pairing or anything so we turned yeah. it off uh, but it is something i'd like to do largely because i would i would like to have a workflow where you can like do all the circuit python -y things of editing files and getting your serial over over bluetooth instead of usb um yeah i mean it it it, I mean, the idea of being able to do the code to Pi, uh, for instance, onto the, the using the UART service in Nordic seems very interesting as a as a workflow for just supporting right. all sorts of interesting things, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, is this, I wouldn't do it. I would only do the REPL over the UART. I wouldn't do the actual file transfers, but yeah. Yeah, basically doing it over BLE is really interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think we should just like take it to discord later when we can take a look at what you've got and and yeah provide some yeah i mean i'll I'll, I, I'll probably have to clean it up or whatever but i i can I, i'm not sure what the best way to share it, just maybe as, as a as a repo or something and yep either a repo or a gist uh, okay tend to be the best ways 
Okay. Um, and you know, it's, I guess, you know, it's a two part system. So there's this stuff that's on the in Pythonista and then there's this stuff mm -hmm. that's on the device. So should I just share the device side or, I mean, I, I, I mean, both is, I, I'm actually quite interested to see what the API for Beely from Pythonista is. Yeah. It's, um, it's, yeah. It, it, it's, um, I, I mean, I, I was originally doing, because we because of whatever weird workflow thing we have, were having debates about internally, I had basically done a two boards to each other and serial interface. And mm -hmm. um, I had just was having a tremendous amount of difficulty because it was like a three-part system with multiple states and all these things to get that to be robust. And I mm -hmm. when I switched over to using the, you know, the Pythonista, I... I I, you know, I, I didn't even have to go and do block by block val validation of, of data transfer. It just started working very robustly. So it was really hmm. remarkable in that regard. I mean, I don't know. Of course, I may not be programming particularly well, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it, was a, it was an interesting shift. I know. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, and of course, you know, once you get on the phone, the resources on the phone are just you know, magical. And right, right. You can do all sorts of things. So that's, uh, yeah, a whole lot more. Yeah. So um, yeah, let's move on. Yeah, so so I so I'll I'll do that, and I guess I'll just catch up with you on on Discord. Is that yep. the best? I mean, I don't. Yeah, you can just at Tan Newt on Discord in the Circuit Python channel. We'll get okay. me, and then you can post, and other people can chime in as well. Okay. Okay. Great. Cool. Okay, let's talk about the second bit about I squared C. Yeah. So the. The 20... I, mean, I, th I think I, I think I chatted with. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember if it was you were, you were or not, but I, I, I did, it was it was several months ago. But I was mm -hmm. basically trying to solve this problem, and and I think you pointed me towards one of you know the simplest version of a of a of an interrupt service right. like pin change or something like that, and that right. would have been starting point to, to to build it. I just didn't, mm -hmm. didn't ran out of time to go do that. But yeah, so, so... go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I was going to say. So your twenty, as 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 Jeff already pointed out in in the text too, the delays you're seeing are probably the garbage collection, uh -huh. and it's pretty really it's really hard. Like we do not. Scott has mentioned this several times. We don't guarantee anything about doing things in kind of relatively hard real time in Circuit Python because of the circuit of delays like garbage collection and just general overhead. So yeah. I'm not sure you can you can succeed at without writing a C module and having to do a lot of work in the background. I'm not sure you can succeed at doing one millisecond sampling of anything. Yeah, I mean, I guess I my my I mean, you know, having you know earlier written some little piece of code for you know, I mean, it's not not super exciting, but you know, just just an interrupt driven data sampler, um, you know. It seems as though I mean, and, and I don't know. This is kind of maybe the, the underlying question, which is, well, what if what if you created a highest level priority interrupt? And I don't quite, I haven't gone to see how you're doing all of this, but and and essentially, its job was just to fill memory. Mm -hmm. um, with yeah, so then we might need to do double buffering, and then because yeah. so it's you know we do this kind of stuff for audio right now, and yeah. maybe you can keep up, maybe you can't. I I would. One question is whether it's worth, you know, Circuit Python is not the solution to everything, and maybe in this case, you don't necessarily want to do it in in Circuit Python or Micro Python or anything else where the latency is not um, yeah well, easy so, to control. Well, yeah, I mean, I I, I sort of yeah. I mean, if I were, if I were doing a you know whatever a, a like a the product which we will eventually get to, yeah. I probably won't won't use it won't use it. I mean, it, I, I think I guess. The part that seems really exciting about this is the degree to which I've been able to to provide, but between you know all the great documentation, I mean you know, I sort of face this challenge of having to support people who don't know what they're doing, and if I spend a lot of time supporting them, I I can't do my job right. So mm -hmm. like I, I what's so fantastic about all of this, and I think it's you know it's sort of why I advocate I call it Adafruit engineering as a way to do prototyping is that it's 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 just remarkable how far people can get right. using all these great resources you have. So for instance, if there was a way to do this regular data sampling, you know, suddenly you'd, you'd, you'd have this whole pipeline related to doing machine learning related to capturing data it, for, for time series stuff. It, it, mm -hmm. And it, 
it just like lights up this whole and it's really i mean it's exciting it's exciting it was really exciting and all my friends who do this stuff professionally are all kind of excited about it so I, w I was thinking like wow that i wonder if that that's a paradigm shift in education kind of thing. right of course I, I don't know i'm i'm of course in a little corner here ranting but yeah i think so that it, it, it seems pretty cool so i, I don't know <laughs> I, I think you're right i think the challenge is like you you will need a native module to do it and i don't yeah. think you're I, I think you're okay with that yeah, um, yeah no I, I mean actually i think part 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 of it would be that i don't just go and kludge something together and then i you know i think part of i'm just somewhat daunted by it yeah. i mean I, i'm not a i'm a, i'm actually an exec because i and then so i i'm not a professional developer for a long time now and and so i'm just looking at the entire activity going like oh my gosh i i'm gonna have to learn a bunch of stuff <laughs> That I, that I, I'm sure I can do it, but I just I'm just gonna run out of time, and so so I'm I think I think for me maybe it's just a little bit of training wheels to help to, yeah. to join the community the right way, and that's what I'm trying to do here. I mean, I, yep. I'm off very conscious. I'm like wasting everybody's time talking too much. So I think this no, is just no, no. Uh, you're fine. You're fine. Like that's right. what this is what in the weeds is for. Um, again, I'm happy to point you to how how to like start adding a new native module. Mm -hmm. Um. Like shared bindings is the directory where you kind of lay out what the API is, and and I that's the place I am more critical in reviewing. But um, like getting that API right is interesting to me. I think yeah. one question I have for you is how much data are you logging at one millisecond? Is it um, can you fit it in I RAM? Oh yeah, yeah. I just think the the issue is that that we record for a long time, and then I definitely run out of RAM. And as okay. soon as you know, I'm already fighting these battles of like, and I'm now I've added Bluetooth, and I'm now running out of memory, sort of. Right. And I'm trying to have to do the optimizations. Right. Um, so, so that, is it a is it sorry, a custom ahead. board as well? Uh, not right now. I'm just using the. I'm okay. Using variations of the the feather, um, you know, fifty two. Um, right. Plus. So the other thing to worry about is erase times on the spy flash. Um, they are also on the order of milliseconds. Um, oh, I'm, I'm using an SD card, so I'm, I don't I don't know if that's I, it, or how would you maybe that's the same thing. I I'm not sh I don't think they have erase times actually. Uh, I think Jeff would know the SD card details. I mean, I, d I did some spelunking of, of write times and things like that, uh, and I found a bunch of folk who were doing tests over on MicroPython, mm -hmm. and I, I did some experiments, and then something happened, and what I thought was faster seemed to not even matter. It was like writing the file with zeros first, and then, right. I mean, that was sort of the advice, and it, then it didn't seem to matter. So I I am... You know, I, I feel like that, that's something that could be explored more. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think part of it was just this mystery of like, what is the system going off and doing? And it's interesting that you're saying um, uh, garbage collection, because I, I was imagining it was, well, I filled the buffer up and now it's writing out to disk and that's taking time or something because I, I didn't know what what else could be going on. Right. So, I so that's the other piece is the profiling piece. I, I'm, you know, how, how to, how to know what's happening. Right? But I, I mean, that's... what I would, yeah. If you have a logic analyzer, you could just scope the like enable line on the SD card. Yeah, That'll give right. you an idea of like how long the writes to the SD card take. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. So yeah, my I, notes I not, about I have not a from the hardware perspective yet. So that's a, that's an interesting idea. I should probably just profile it that way. Yeah. So my notes about the speed of writing to SD cards, um, I was looking at doing text logging. So I would print something followed by a new line. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on the interface, I was getting anywhere between 160 lines to 1,000 lines per second. Uh, but nothing that I was looking at uh, would have tracked worst case latency. Um, so like uh, Tanut was saying, when you finish that block of 512, that is when it's going to pause and write out a block of 512 bytes of data. And you'll wait till the SD card says, I'm done, uh, before it will return to the Python code and you know run the next line. Mm -hmm. So you might get to 1,000 per second, but that doesn't really characterize how long is a maximum pause going to be. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm uh, using the timer uh, in a loop right? to to measure the durations on a per sample basis. And when I, I mean, we're actually logging that because we're resampling the data mm -hmm. as a way as a way to work around this issue, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I mean, if you 
you know about signal processing it's kind of you get into the weeds pretty quickly but you know it's it's um yeah it's not optim it's not ideal um but yeah no, we're we're just reading single values and aside from having to like add additional information to be able to reconstruct the data which is uh, sort of doubling our payload um right. we you know we're it's not really that much. I mean, I think you know, if you had a little, a small little ISR, it could it could go do the writing to the to the memory. I think the issue, question, the question then would be, when you go off and write to the disk, or you go off and do these other things, could that process still be going on in the background? And then you just make the buffer big enough, and and presumably it would work. I, I, mm -hmm. I mean, at least that would be the first pass I would do. Um, yeah, I think but, I, I think with I squared C, that one of the other challenges is that like how what you're reading and how you read it is like so specific to the i squared c chip um oh yeah i'm i'm, I'm using the the, the ads 1115 and it's you know that that seems to be fine and you know when i say one millisecond i'm actually not being honest right it's slower so you know it's just it's uh it's all sort of in that zone it's in the mm -hmm. you know sub sub two millisecond region which i it all you know when when we when it when we don't have these mysterious disappearances, you know, we're easily able to do sub two millisecond sampling. Yeah, um, that sounds like the and, garbage collector then. And is there a way to suppress the garbage collector? <laughs> well, you'll run out of memory. Uh, but the the approach I would well, recommend I is I mean, I, I'm glad to come let it come back. I think you know I think it's just a it's, it's one of these things where well where, so. During so, capture, it doesn't have to capture all the time. It captures during a you know an experiment, and so then it right. can recover. I suppose. Yeah. So the garbage collector only runs if it tried to allocate and it couldn't. Um, it's not going to run before it it needs the memory. Um, yeah. But there, That's I yeah okay. I added a memory monitor and a memory. What did I call the other thing? I added memory yeah. monitor, and there's a way to alarm when you allocate. So you could just like be very particular about your core loop and make sure it doesn't allocate anything. Um, and therefore yeah, I mean, you will never run the garbage collector, but it makes me wonder whether maybe I should, maybe I'm miss not using a, a, a string array and just using a string and that might be causing this. I, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Um, yeah. So there, there are some diagnostics you can do for like measuring yeah. how much memory you're allocating over time. Um, yeah. and you can take Is a look that at that. I turn off the I turn off the display, I, I, which I think was recommended, right? To that that could be the up, the screen updates could be causing they, they'll take glitch, time for sure, yeah. Causing glitches, and then I guess yeah, the other would be the the file writes. Are and doesn't does that that must go away and as well, right? And then come back when it's done, whenever you hit that event, right? Yeah, I don't know the details of the SD card stuff. Um, I was thinking more of the spy flash, so I don't I don't know exactly what the behavior of the SD card will be. Yeah, I mean, I guess as I'm speaking about all this, there's numerous since it's all open, I could just go kind of look at what's going on, and I just haven't done that. So maybe that's also something I can just do, which is just go kind of speed on that yeah. and see what's happening and and get a sense. And if you wanna, if you want just pointers of like where is this done, that's totally game. Just ask that in Circuit Python, and and one of us can point you to places. Oh, okay, okay, that that's super helpful. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, like it's it's in our best interest to have more people know where everything is in the code. So. Yeah, and I'll I will um I mean I guess um, just sorry this is gonna sound incredibly remedial, but I I, I just pull pull a uh, fork um, or whatever. I, I guess I, I'm confused. Probably don't know how to use Git appropriately. But um, basically, take a copy of, of the of the entire build, build it, and then start making changes. Once I have a working version of something, then I would submit that as a PR or something, and then get yeah. feedback. Yeah. We've okay. got two good guides. I think the two good guides you're going to want to take a look at is Katni did an awesome guide about contributing to CircuitPython with Git and GitHub. Okay. Um, so for basic workflow stuff, that'll be good. And then Dan did a really good guide on building CircuitPython. Um, okay. I'll just I'll follow those. In. Okay, great. Thank yeah. You. I'm I'm hoping somebody's gonna drop them in the chat. But I know the building CircuitPython one is straight up just like building CircuitPython is the URL. Okay. So yeah. This one. I think I may have done that once because I I did a build for some target oh it might have been for yeah i can't remember it was it was a specific 
one thing I tried. And um, then there's this one. Okay, so I think you've got enough to go on. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, there's one thing I did want to ask. I've just realized, sorry, I should have written it down, which is just, I'm there. there is this thing that seems to be happening, and it seems to happen on boards that we've been doing development cycles on, which is that we'll get these sporadic soft boots, mostly on restart, and they seem to, it seems to stabilize out. Um, in other words, it'll do a few soft reboots, and then it'll stop doing that. But it... So that tends to be uh, the way that your host OS treats new USB disks. Uh, so if okay, you so have like an antivirus or some sort of scanner or something, like that will like do some writes to the USB disk, which will trigger those first reloads. Uh, and you think it might do that because it's actually showing up as a device in the file in the file system or something like that and right it's like if you plugged in a new reset it. yeah okay got it yeah if you do a full reset you're going to do a full usb enumeration and it'll got treat it. you like a yes, new that drive makes that makes sense okay i'll i'll sleep that up thanks cool okay uh let's go on to foamy guy Yeah, I had a pretty quick one, I think, probably. And it's, you know, basically just uh, I created that Monster Mask library over the weekend. I was curious if there was interest in getting that into the, the main uh, bundle or if it would be more appropriate just to, to load that up in the community bundle. I think loading it to the main bundle would be great. OK, cool. Um, uh, just make sure it's, you know, cleaned up to standard, so on and so forth. Um, we'll yep. I got PR it. Um, I got pilot in black to run on it one thing i did notice with it being under my github account currently the actions are failing i'm not 100 percent sure why and i suspect it's to do with being under my account so okay. the Adafruit account um, but that's something i might need a little bit of help with at some point is getting the actions if i can't uh, get that figured out i think what we'll do with what makes the most sense is to actually fork it to the adafruit account okay um and then you can um Either, you know, you can still work on yours and then push your brother PR to the Adafruit account, um, any updates that you okay. want to do. Awesome. Um, yeah, that's perfect. We okay. can transfer. We can, you can also transfer it to us. So the master copy belongs to Adafruit and then you can fork it again. Oh, so that's I will. Opinion. I have not that's done that before. I'm sure that's in settings or somewhere. I can poke around a little bit uh, and figure yeah, that out. That's, I will... that's also a good way to do it. Cool. Um, and then, yeah, just, you know, once, once you do that and you refork it, um, just start trading it like any other library where you work on your fork, um, or work on a branch, blah, blah, blah. It's all the same thing. All righty. We'll do. Okay. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Next up we have Folknology. Who I don't think is talk. Are you talking? So you tried to unmute, but I do not hear you. Yeah, your your thing is not turning green, so your mic is not working. You might need to change the microphone device. Yeah, we did talk about it a little bit before, so I I have a feeling I could lead a discussion about it, but um, may not may not be what we may but may not be the questions you you have. And do you hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm good. I hear somebody else. That might be the next one. Oh, yeah. I hear you. Yeah, for the next one. All right. Well, let, let's uh, let's go to David, and then we'll go back to Folknology at the end. And if Folknology can't talk, then we'll just uh, talk a bit more about it. So go ahead, David. Yeah, so it was it's very basic, and I guess I've got the solution. So I've got that Corona app detector stuff and I tried on different outputs. Basically, I produce um, a list of colors mm -hmm. and I did that on NeoPixel, on .stars, on NeoTrellis. And now I'm going to do it on the screen of the clue with uh, some square of various colors. Mm -hmm. And I need, I'm looking for a way to abstract that so that my code kind of stay the same and I 
use an API or something to say, I want color, that color on that position. Um, because now I've got three or four versions of the same code, with just changing mm -hmm. a few bits. So yeah. I don't know if anybody did that. I don't know of one that does that works for display IO, but I would the API I would I would go for is the uh, PyPixel buff API, which kind of abstracts the like how do you set the nth thing to a color. So that should already cover you for dot star and NeoPixel. I don't know if it works for Neo Trellis, but uh, PyPixel like Pixel buff would be what I would suggest. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and I can from that go to the screen also. Right, so okay. create a thing that creates a bunch of squares or whatever on the display I/O, and then treat each square like you would a NeoPixel. Yeah, uh, um, for the squares, I'm using the palette, color palette. Yep. So I, I create a very tiny bitmap mm -hmm. that I scale up with uh, display I/O so that it goes fast. Yep. And I only change the palette color, mm -hmm. and my my bitmap is always the same. And actually, I could be creative and put dots or any kind of image because I'm just changing a color. Right. Yeah, it's just, yeah, you make sure you have multiple copies of that bitmap that reference different palettes. So it has to be multiple tile grids. Don't make it one giant tile grid because when the palette changes, it refreshes the whole thing that the palette reference is referenced by if that makes sense okay yeah uh, okay <laughs> yeah so one one tile grid and one palette per neopixel in quotes and then you can share the bitmap between them oh no well okay the idea is to have one bitmap and i can draw a pixel any shape I like mm -hmm. using one color. And then when I want to change that pixel, which is a picture of a pixel, right? I just change the palette color. Right. And if you have multiple, you have multiple copies of that bitmap. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that yeah. should work. OK, that's it. Awesome. Thanks, David. All right, let's circle back to Folknology and see if their mic works. No, it says it works in the test, but doesn't work in the channel, which I have not heard of before. Um, but let me read it off, and we can talk. Of, oh, yeah, do you have push to talk on? That would be the last thing to check. So this will be our last topic, and then I'll wrap up. Okay, how about it now? There you go. Now it hear. was. It was the uh, what you said. So uh, I've been working on the communication for the Alloy Featherboard, whereby the ESPS2 has to talk to the FPGA. So initially, I thought I'd use SPI, um, and I had some real weirdness with it, and couldn't work out exactly what was going on. Um, and it turns out, because I was just writing single register values to the registers, you know, represented inside the FPGA at this point, mm -hmm. um, the signal, if you look at the entire transaction, i.e. from the, you know, the downward, the uh, negative edge of the CS right through to the positive edge of the CS, you know, the actual data part where we're actually clocking it is a very tiny part of that. The example I used on the forum was, you know, if you were running at, say, 20 megaboard, for example, on your SPI to mm -hmm. do the transaction, then it's less than half a microsecond for the data. But because you're manually bit banging the, um, you know, the chip select pin, right? there's some 44.5 microseconds worth of, you know, nothing, basically, either side of the, the signal. Mm-hmm. So even when it's on a loop, just sending, you know, single register updates, it's spending all of its time just doing the bit banging and very little time doing the transfer. Right. Now, longer term, you know, as per our, you know, all the helpful conversations I've had with the guys 
and girls down on the uh, Discord, we're probably going to go towards using a native module or something to do mm -hmm. this because the nature of what it is that I'm doing is slightly different to how you'd normally be using the SPMI. But there are quite a lot of cases where, you know, if you're doing very short register writes or reads, um, then getting rid of that latency would be useful. Mm -hmm. Is it therefore possible, you know, to build in the hardware support for CS? Because that would kind of solve the problem. Then your CS envelope period mm -hmm. will be focused around just delivering the data rather than, mm -hmm. you know, just hanging around doing nothing. Or for that matter, stealing, you know, cycles away from the CPU. Right. So I think, um, you know, this has been on my radar in terms of like, the bus device library is like really core to how we suggest people using spy and i squared c and it's implemented mm -hmm. in python so i think there's a i think you'll see a lot of performance gain simply from bit banging it from c and not from python um so right. so the approach i would go is simply recreate adafruit bus device in native circuit python um and you'll see a lot of that that I think that overhead of the CS lines uh, is actually like Python VM overhead, not like actual bit banging overhead. Um, okay. So what I would do is just recreate a Adafruit bus device in as a native module. And then like, I think you'll see that bit banging CS transaction time go down a lot, even if you're not using like the, the CS line from the spy driver directly. Okay, right. So in other words, bit banging in C, you mean? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So literally, like, re just re-implement the way that Adafruit bus device works in in as a native module, and that will give you the flexibility in the longer term. Uh, if if you do want a special case, it like oh, if the CS pin you give it happens to be the one that the peripheral knows, then like you could hook into that if you really wanted to. But I suspect it's not going to be any different than if you were just doing it from C. Okay. Cool. Okay. Well, that's uh, certainly worth trying. Yeah. Um, the other question I had there, um, Scott, is um, is there any kind of library for doing, for seeing how the CPU is being used or stats kind of thing? Uh, not that I know of. Um, okay. Hey, uh, this is Warrior of Wire. I've written a thing that does this. Um, I've spent a fair amount of effort uh, tracking down um, uh, stacks that hang. Um, it's not super suitable for uh, sub microsecond and uh, like single digit microsecond timing, but it's very helpful for uh, figuring out which stacks are expensive. Um, I can sling you a link in Discord if you're interested. That'd be very cool. Yeah, I'd love to see Thank that you. too. Uh, the approach yeah, I've taken is. Go ahead. I was going to say the approach I've taken is just like inserting like a uh, pin set high and low in the C code and just logic analyzing to see how long time is spent somewhere. Yeah, that's going to be a lot more precise. Um, my library is. Um, is just a tool that I use for my own projects when I'm when I'm doing perf optimization and uh, and uh, yeah it's um, you can see in the docs it's um, it's supposed to be instrumentation that you can uh, put into your uh, projects and then just disable it rather than like going back through and commenting everything out and um, you know as long as like the bytes uh, of your uh, of your Python um, isn't a, isn't a concern it's mm -hmm. like no run overhead so. Um, it's, it's not, it's not as precise as, uh, as, as, um, using your scope, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it's, it's pretty convenient, um, for just watching it on a, on a, on a serial terminal. Yeah. Super neat. Yeah. That's cool. I'm going to have a look at that. Perfect. Uh, and, Thanks, uh, Scott. that's all of my questions, I think. Great. And I would, I would just say, if we wanted to add some native helper for something like that, uh, I would just follow the model of like the memory monitor thing. Um, 
if you ever needed like hooks into the native stuff just to help you with it. All right, awesome. Yeah. All right, let me take a time code. Thank you everybody for joining us for this CircuitPython weekly meeting for October 19th, 2020. It's been great. Uh, thank you to the new folks in particular for joining us. Uh, if you're listening to this later and want to join us, it's uh, regularly at Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern on the Adafruit Discord server, uh, which you can join by going to the URL adafru.it slash Discord. Uh, we're there all week. Uh, we are chatting all things CircuitPython all week long and happy to answer questions. Uh, we have both help with CircuitPython for, like, how do I use CircuitPython questions, and we have um, the CircuitPython channel for more development uh, details as well. Um, this meeting has been recorded and will be posted to the Adafruit YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Adafruit. And the audio gets ripped out and sent along as podcasts as well. So if you're not able to make the meeting, uh, one, you can put notes in the notes doc if you'd like us to read us off. And two, you can listen to it after the fact. And with that, I think, uh, let me check the calendar. But next week is on a regular time, if I'm right. Yep. Uh, so next week will also be on Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we love to see you there, and uh, we'll see you on Discord this week. Thank you, everyone.